This is a European Maker Fair. So we met uh, Joy Hardy, Queen, Mark from Felder, all Americans. Now it's time for European to give a keynote address. And so uh, why we make things, why we make stuff? Because we, we want to, because we think it's important, we think it's relevant, but also because for the joy of making. This is exactly the point of the next speaker from Westminster, David Gauntlet. Hello, Rome. It's great to see so many people here from Make a Fair Rome. Um, I understand this is a thousand seater auditorium and there's people standing up and down the sides as well. So it's great to see everybody here. Um, I'm David Gauntlet. I'm going to say some big, broad things about making. We've already heard about some particular technologies, great new ideas that are coming through. I'm not going to give you anything specific like that. I'm going to talk in very general terms about why making is important for society and why it's great for innovation, for the economy, and for making people happy, as Ricardo mentioned. So a couple of years ago, I wrote a book called Making is Connecting. Um, so you might think, well, that sounds like old news. But today, on today, there's a lobby coming towards this auditorium with a big pile of books, um, which are going to be on sale in the Arduino bookstore, I understand, um, of the Italian translation of uh, Making is Connecting. Um, called La Societa di Makers. You can see I am an Italian man. I, I translated it myself. I didn't translate it myself. It was translated by Tiziano Bonini, who's here somewhere, uh, and he did a great job. Um, so that's actually published today. It became available on Kindle yesterday. So we managed to get the timing pretty good. I think you'll agree. Um, so I'm going to say, no, first of all, I'm going to start with the three reasons why I say making is connecting. Big basic stuff. Um, I say making is connecting because, first of all, when you make things, obviously, you take materials, you put them together, and you make something new. Um, making is connecting also because um, creativity always involves, at some point, a kind of social element. People come together, they share ideas, and so it's about connecting people. But also, and perhaps most importantly, number three, um, making is connecting because I think when you make something and put it out into the world, you're sort of creating a connection between yourself and the world. It sort of bonds you and sort of fuses you more into life itself, in a way. It's about becoming part of the environment you're in, participating in the world. I think that's a really important one. And I'm going to be saying some more on that in my following five points for this 15-minute talk. I've boiled it down to five. Um, so here's the first one. The first one is about... You'll hear a lot about electronics and the digital world and the internet today, and that's great. Um, you'll also, hopefully, I think at the Maker Fair, you'll see quite a lot of sort of straightforward stuff made with toothpicks and glue. Uh, offline creativity, you might call it. Um, I think it's important to point out, and uh, the research I did for the book certainly shows that these are all part of the same thing. They're all part of the same kind of human experience. Sometimes you can read things about online creativity, which seem to suggest that uh, basically, creativity was invented in about 1995, and suddenly creativity went woof from nothing. Of course, that's not true. Humans have been creative for literally millions of years, um, and what we see today is a continuation of that. But certainly, uh, you know, the internet helps massively because it really helps connect up people. Um, you heard. Joey said that thanks to the maker movement, which I assume means quite a lot online, at least at first, people get involved online, um, well, then he, he now feels part of something. And otherwise, he'd just be like this, you know, strange kid. Sorry, Joey. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Uh, I was there too. You know, this a strange kid that loves to make things, and everybody else thinks you're a bit strange. Um, now it turns out there's millions of people like that around the world, but they don't necessarily live next door to you. So the internet helps massively with that connecting and building communities. Of course. Um, the other thing that's really good, of course, is connecting up the two. So uh, online and offline are part of the same thing. And when you find things that really bring those things together and make use of the affordances of both the online and the offline, that can be really magic. Um, but number two, this is about the spirit of the maker. And I like to connect what's happening today with um, there was a thing called the arts and crafts movement, which started in England more than 100 years ago, like 150 years ago. Um, one of the key inspirations for them was this uh, Victorian philosopher guy called John Ruskin. I'll tell you one thing about him. John Ruskin was really excited 
and sort of loved those gargoyles that you get on medieval cathedrals. Rough looking things. He was a kind of art critic and people couldn't understand why he liked this rough, ugly kind of stuff. It wasn't finely made, it wasn't finely polished. It was made by craftspeople who were building cathedrals, so they're working on these big projects. Um, but they took time within that general building work to make these quirky, individual, strange things. Um, and John Ruskin loves these precisely because what you can see in them is the spirit of a maker, an individual who has something to communicate, something to express. They just want to make something that's kind of special and unique to them. It's theirs. They want to put it in the world. And I think it's lovely that he likes these for that reason. And I think if you bring that forward to today, if you look at all of the creative things that people are doing at Maker Faires, uh, the robots they make, the, the craft stuff they do, if you look online at videos on YouTube made by millions of people, you know, um, they're not necessarily that smart. They're not necessarily that professional. They don't necessarily look like they were made by a company. But what you can see in them is the spirit of a maker. There's somebody that's got something they want to express. They want to put it out, in the, put it out there in the world and to make a connection with somebody else. And I think that's what's one of the really important things about making. Whoop. Um, point three is about why people make things. For writing this book that I mentioned, um, I did research. I, I looked at lots of research which had been done about why people like to make things online, because people research about that. And I looked at research about why people like to make things offline in the craft world, people just making physical stuff, because there's research about that. And what I found was that these things are very similar. People's motivations are very similar. And I've boiled it down to three things here. The first one is that people like to have the sense of, um, sense of themselves as an active creative agent in the world. So it's the idea that you, you're, in the, you're in the world, participating, making something, being part of the world. But then secondly, people like to be involved with networks. It's not just individual. individual. Uh, people like to be part of communities, to have dialogues, to have conversations makes sense. I'm sure you recognize that one. Um, thirdly, people want to be recognized. This was a thing that came through in all of the research. Um, and you, you might think it's a bit of a strange one. This is people wanting recognition from other people. It makes them seem a bit needy or something. But, but you know, why not? We're all human. It's nice to be recognized by another person. And this point is about people wanting to be sort of seen as a person who knows about something, who's got something to contribute, something to communicate. And other people recognize that, and they engage around that. And, and these are all reasons that you probably recognize, but um, you got this very clearly in what people do online and what people do offline as well. So that's all part of that continuity again. Point number four, this is a thing where, um, I, as I said, I finished this book more than two years ago, but the points only sl sl quite slowly start to trickle down into your brain. It takes a while for you to process it, even, you know, I wrote the thing, but I'm only starting to work out what the points are. And this is a point which has really struck me recently, the importance of small steps. Often when people are making political kind of messages, messages about how we can change the world, they always talk about really big things, you know, big sort of amazing change that we might hope will happen in the future done by somebody, but you can't do it yourself, it's just some big dream. And, and it's important to have big dreams, of course, we love big dreams. But as an individual, what can you do about that? I think the nice thing about the maker movement is that you can see lots of people taking small steps into a changed world. Because you know, when you make something and you share it in the world, I think it's about sort of breaking with what society, uh, what society often expects. Because society often expects us, doesn't it, to be an audience of things or a fan of things. There's lots of great professionally made media and things in the world that you're expected to be an audience of. And, and that's fine, you know, there's lots of nice things to consume. But taking a step beyond being a consumer into a world where you're actually, you've made something, you share it in the world, people might like it, people might make a comment. Um, that's great, and it doesn't need to be big. You can do something that is only seen by two or three people. Uh, you can do something that doesn't look very professional, maybe, you know, maybe even compared to the work of other makers. It's a bit disappointing. You haven't become really great at making yet. That doesn't matter. The important thing is, you've made something, you've put it in the world. And anything is great there. I think the thing about it is that what you've got is somebody saying, here I am. And they're saying, I made this. And it can be a, 
A very simple thing they've done. You know, they can be taking a very small step. But taking that step into a new world where you're actually a creative maker yourself, willing to share it with other people, get inspiration and ideas from them, give inspiration and ideas to them from the thing you've done yourself, I think that's really great. So you've got people just saying, here I am. I made this. And then, of course, for reasons that we've already talked about, be people become part of communities, they get connected online, then you do get less individualistically. Here we are, and we made this. And when you've got groups of people who are able to say that, they're participating in the world, they're making stuff, I think that's really great. That's maybe the thing that's most exciting about the maker movement. Another thing that's great about the maker movement, and you'll see it really at the maker fair, is that the people saying, we made this, is lots of different kinds of people all coming together. Um, you know, we're, we're all excited about Arduino and 3D printing and all the sort of high-tech stuff. But at the same time, at Maker Fairs, you'll see people um, doing, you know, knitting and craft stuff, making brilliant things just with their hands, with very simple technologies, but not high-tech stuff. And, you know, all kinds of different stuff. But all of it is part of the maker movement. That's the great thing. It's not like these people are more successful or more innovative than these people. These people are all doing great making things. That's what I think is inspiring about it. But I'll move on to point five. Point five is about how the maker movement is maybe really remaking making. Um, it, those of us who make things, it means that you appreciate the craft and the work that goes into making something. So I think that's good news also for professional makers. I know that's a concern in Italy at the moment. Italy's got a great tradition of craft and making. And uh, the internet is sometimes seen as a challenge to that, because the internet is a source of cheap alternatives. Um, but as you know, the maker movement is not a bunch of people who are excited about cheap alternatives. It's a group of people who are excited about the possibilities of what you can make and the beauty and craft that goes into making something. So that could be good news for Italian crafters. Um, and also, the maker movement is really about just the joy of making things. Making things makes you happy. In the book, I haven't got time to talk about it now, but in the book, I've got actual statistics and, and numbers and things based on surveys of happiness, which show that participating in the world, making something, putting it out there, actually contributes to the stock of human happiness. And what could be more important than that? The little bird is there to remind me, as a, one of my two concluding points, that um, it's quite easy to dismiss people making things, isn't it? If you've just got like, a person over here, they've made a robot. That's great, you know, well done them. But maybe that's not going to change the world. And you've got somebody over here, and she's knitted a good jumper. It's a lovely jumper, but it's not going to change the world. Because we don't think of either robots or jumpers as being things that are going to change the world in themselves. But all of these things together, all of these individuals doing something active, creative in the world, making something, putting it out there, sharing it with others, I think it really does add up to something really vital and significant. Um, you know, a, a society where people are not encouraged to be creative is like a tree cut off from its roots. It just withers and dies. And if we embrace the creativity, the creativity of the maker movement, um, you know, it's, it's fantastic for reinvigorating innovation. It really sort of gets society going again in all kinds of ways, both in terms of technology and innovation on that side and just getting kids excited about learning and making stuff as well. All of that is all part of the same thing, and it's all really exciting. Which brings me to my final point, which is just that passion that you see at maker fairs and in the maker movement. I think almost uniquely, um, in the maker movement, you've got all these people doing stuff just because it's what they want to do. They're not doing it for kind of any other reason. M mostly they're not doing it because they're trying to get qualifications. Mostly they're not doing it because they want to make a load of money, because that might not work. They're not really doing it because they want to gain high social status. That might not work either. They're doing it because it's the thing they love to do. They're really driven by passion. People who just want to make stuff and share it in the world. Um, and across all different kinds of activity as well. It's just that same driving passion. You ask people why they've made stuff, maybe like as a researcher from a university or whatever, you ask people why they made things. Half the time, they don't know. It's because they wanted to, because you could. You know, I wanted to impress my kid. I thought it'd be cool. Those are the reasons. I just wanted to do the thing. And that's what makes things really exciting, and I hope you'll see a lot of that at the Maker Fair here this weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you, David.